All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this live stream presentation in collaboration with the Los Alamos Mountaineers. Uh, this virtual event is brought to you by the Pajarito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, which operates the Los Alamos Nature Center. Uh, my name is Rachel, and I'm the marketing manager at PEAK, and I'll be your moderator tonight. The Nature Center is still closed, but do check the PEAK website, that's peaknature.org, for more live stream presentations like this one. I want to give a quick shout out to our wonderful members, donors, volunteers, and staff who are making it possible for us to continue offering programming at this time. Thank you all so much for your support. Tonight, we'll be hearing from France Cordova, who will discuss her adventures in Antarctica. But before that, we'll get started with the Mountaineers meeting. So I think that's everything from me. Again, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to chat me. I'll be monitoring th that throughout the program. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Melanie and she will start the Mountaineers meeting. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, we're very glad to have you join us for the very first um, Los Alamos Mountaineers meeting of the year. Um, we have a great show for you tonight. And uh, before we get on to the rest of our agenda, um, I had a couple of announcements I wanted to make. Uh, we have a number of um, opportunities to get some um, training in a variety of different things um, this coming month. And so I, I thought um, I would mention these things to you. Some of them uh, may require a fee, but uh, I still felt that it was worthy to let you know that uh, these things are, um, are available. So um, the first thing uh, that we have is a virtual ski waxing demonstration on Wednesday, January 27th, which is tomorrow. Uh, you can register through peaknature.org slash events and um, Clay Mosley from the Southwest Nordic Ski Club will be uh, providing that demonstration. We have a top rope belay class uh, offered at the Los Alamos Family YMCA on February 7th. It's uh, going to run from 12 p.m. to approximately 4 p.m. There will be a fee and only up to four people are uh, allowed in one classroom. There will be uh, an opportunity to sign up on a waiting list. The American Avalanche Association seminar is on February 10th at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. Um, you might want to uh, get more information through their website. Um, that will also possibly require a fee. And the second annual Colorado Backcountry Avalanche Workshop is February 18th. We have some additional um, training opportunities that we're developing through the Los Alamos Mountaineers. We have uh, you know, a potential avalanche training in a virtual Google Classroom in development. And uh, special thanks to Michael Altair for that. Uh, InReach GPS Users Group um, is starting to coordinate, uh, coordinate GPS coordinates and collect them for sharing trail information. Also, uh, we are still searching for lamb tre treasures or Los Alamos Mountaineers treasures. Uh, we would like to interview longtime members about their knowledge and expertise. Uh, please feel free to contact the board if you are interested in being interviewed or if you have any suggestions on who uh, should be interviewed. So tonight's agenda will include um, membership renewals uh, by Rod McCready, uh, trip report, new trips, and then our presentation from France Cordova. So uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Rod McCready. Um, just wanted to remind people what the dues are used for. Um, we, they do go toward providing these programs and um, tonight's gonna be another great one. Um, access to club resources like the Garmin inReach that Melanie mentioned, ropes, avalanche beacons, and plenty of other stuff. Um, we do support the up, 
keep of some trails, climbing routes and things like that with small grants. And Zach talked about that recently. And of course the trips. So you can do it by mail. Just put a check in an envelope, make it out for 20 bucks for a family membership or 15 for an individual and send it to this address right here. Most of this you already know. Mountaineers Club, Los Alamos. So the only thing you got to remember about this address is 987. It's easy to remember. 987. Nine's a special number, eight's a special number, seven's a special number too. So just remember that. Or you can go to the lamountaineers.org webpage, click on membership. You can scroll down here. <clears throat> I already have family membership selected there. I'm going to use PayPal to do it. Um, so again, please renew your membership. It's a good cause and uh, provides you with a lot of fun. At this point, I'll turn it over to Cecile Jemez. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Rod, for that was a good presentation. And just, uh, I was able to uh, pay my dues. I don't have a PayPal account and I was still able to use the PayPal button. So. Um, just for information, you don't need a PayPal account to be able to use PayPal to pay your membership dues. So welcome uh, everybody, good evening and happy new year to all. Um, and thank you for attending the January, January meeting of the Los Alamos Mountaineers. I'm going to present the um, trips uh, that happened the past, uh, this past month. Uh, I'll start with the club sponsored activities and then I'll, um, I'll present the um, individual pictures uh, that members have shared with me uh, about their trips. So we had three club sponsored activities this past month. Um, the winter gear and clothes drive in December. So thank you to the 12 uh, volunteers who organized the event and the collection of um, uh, they ended up collecting 800 cubic feet of uh, clothing that they distributed to five homeless shelters um, in northern New Mexico. So thank you so much for that effort. Uh, Michael Arthur um, is, um, led an avalanche rescue refresher in December um, and they um, send us those beautiful pictures uh, and as uh, Melanie mentioned, uh, more to come on uh, avalanche rescue training um, via Google Classroom. And thank you, Michael, for um, leading that very important training for the Mountaineers. Uh, Michael and Jean also led a ski tour to welcome uh, 2021 on January 1st. Um, they had five, uh, 10 participants, sorry, that uh, they divided in two pods uh, with staggered departure. Um, and the two pods ended up um, uh, being brought together when they encountered some deep snow and the members um, of the group took turns uh, breaking trail. And eventually they found some nice single track and were able to practice turns. And Michael took actually another group two days later um, because of COVID restrictions, they couldn't take all the participants on January 1st. So Michael took another small group on uh, January 3rd to Brazos and looks like they had gorgeous weather that day. So now for, uh, now for those um, individual trips. Uh, so thank you to all the members who've shared pictures with me of their adventures uh, outdoors those past few weeks. So Zach, Michael, and a few others uh, obta obtained a special permit to hike uh, to the top of Cerro Grande uh, the day of the peak of the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction. And they took those gorgeous pictures of the night sky. Melanie and David uh, skied near Las Conchas with their dog. Larry sent me this gorgeous picture of uh, Canyon del Cobre. 
I just marvel at, at the you know variety of landscapes that we have here in northern New Mexico. Uh, Kathleen, Karen, and Dennis hiked the Burt Mesa Trail in Vendelier National Monument. Kathleen, Tony, Stewart, and Bill cross country skied on Cañada Bonita. Chris uh, hiked with her dogs in the Jemez Mountain off Forest Road 376. Tony Stewart, uh, Elizabeth, Rob, and Bill uh, explored canyons near Ghost Ranch. France Cordova, her our presenter tonight, and her husband Chris Foster uh, explored the back of um, the backside of Ottawa Peak, and they encountered a plein air uh, painter and also evidence of. Um, of indigenous uh, activity, settlement. Evan Rose sent me a slide with uh, showing the five volcanic plugs he explored this past month. Olivia Lee and three others um, spent two nights at Flat Mountain Yurt and they hiked the Con Continental Divide Trail on both sides. Aline and Bill uh, hiked at Palacio Wash, north of Española. And Aline sent a picture of her grandson, Carter Williams, um, finding a stamp for his peak passport sign, for his peak passport. And Dave Brown enjoyed a hike at graduation point here in town in, in Los Alamos. So the upcoming trips um, include um, the a snowshoe hike to the top of Cerro Grande this Saturday that I'm leading. Uh, it's full at this time. It filled up very quickly. Um, Bill is organizing a llama trek in Utah in April. That trip is full as well at this time. Bill is also organizing a raft trip in Montana on the Selway River. Um, the trip is full and but only has a few people on the waiting list. And finally, Bill also uh, is organizing a um, almost yeah, a week and a half of uh, exploring um, around Moab, um, biking and hiking in Utah. And this trip has a few st spots left. So if you're interested, you can contact Bill at uh, bill at pedorski.net. Um, I want to encourage anyone to lead a trip, uh, even if you've never done it before. The club has many resources to help you organize the trip. And we can even provide um, an experienced leader to back you up if it's your first trip and you would like to have a co-leader. Um, so if you're interested, um, contact me, cecilhemez at gmail.com. Thank you so much for attending and I'll pass it on to Bill. So I'm honored to introduce our speaker tonight, who my long-term friend, Franz Cordova. Uh, we have known each other since graduate school in Pasadena, California, uh, quite a while ago. You know, France has been quite an adventurer over her lifetime. She's climbed the Mexican volcanoes. She's rock climbed pretty extensively in Yosemite. She's summited Cotopaxi in Ecuador. On the professional side, she uh, came to Los Alamos and joined the staff of the lab uh, sometime in the very early uh, 1980s, or perhaps it was 79, and uh, quickly connected with the mountaineers. And she, in fact, met her husband, Chris Foster, climbing at the climbing school on May 6th of 1984. She went on to be the first woman to lead the mountaineers climbing school 
and in fact, the first woman to be the president of the Mountaineers. You know, since those earlier outdoor adventures, she's gotten a, a bit distracted with her distinguished career, which uh, took her to be the chancellor of UC River, Riverside, the president of Purdue University, the director of the National Science Foundation. Um, you know, with those accomplishments uh, behind her, uh, we're very glad to have her back in New Mexico, back adventuring with, with us again. And I would like to turn to France to hear her adventures on the southernmost continent. Thanks very much, Bill. It's been uh, very enjoyable being a part of the Los Alamos Mountaineers. And uh, well, I've, I've known Bill since uh, graduate school. So he's the, definitely the person I've known the longest, it seems. So thank you for that introduction. And over to you, France, for your adventures. Great. Well, good evening, everybody. So let's get started here. Good. Well, here we are. So my opening slide, The Best Journey in the World, has several broad themes. The title for one, it's ironic considering the history of Antarctic exploration. For me, what I'm going to describe was um, the best journey in the world, but for others, it was the worst. There's a photo of ice, which is beautiful in its vastness, but it's also a harbinger of global warming. And there's a photo taken by a colleague of the egg of an emperor penguin. And this egg is going to uh, play a story here uh, this evening. It was um, uh, the desiring to, to get the eggs of the emperor penguin that led a young a zoologist nicknamed Cherry to join Admiral Scott's expedition of 1910. Science, it turns out, was a big part of Scott's expedition. And so I'm going to touch on all of these themes in my talk, but my major emphasis tonight will be on why Antarctica is a special place to travel to. Two people are guests of mine tonight for this presentation. Both have accumulated decades on the ice. Brian Stone was in charge of logistics there for NSF for something like 17 years. And Scott Borg, a geologist, was in charge of science. Both have shepherded hundreds of visits of researchers and dignitaries there over the decades. Both are still at the National Science Foundation in different, more senior administrative roles. Most importantly to me, both were on my trips to the ice. So here is an outline of my talk. The, the major part of my talk is going to be focusing on 10 personal bests, the things that I like best about Antarctica. But I'm going to start with the background, uh, a little bit about the history of Antarctica, about its uh, size, its unique environmental condition, who owns Antarctica, how it's divvied up among nations. So my personal bests are based on my four trips to Antarctica over a quarter of a century. And then I'll end with how you can get to Antarctica. So th these are the covers of two books that are just amazing. I uh, encourage everybody to read them, especially if you're on a long trip somewhere and especially down south to a place like Antarctica. I read them while on long flights to that continent. The Worst Journey in the World is about Robert Falcon Scott's ill-fated journey to Antarctica starting in 1910. It turns out that the actual worst in that title was really the first expedition out of Cape Evans on Ross Island, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, by the author of this book, Apsley Jerry Gerard, Gerard, called Jerry for short. And so he joined Scott's expedition as a zoologist. And um, he, it was his intent as part of the scientific nature of the expedition to recover the eggs of the emperor penguin for scientific study of the evolutionary link between reptiles and birds through their embryos. And so he and the second in command to Scott, a person named Edward Wilson uh, and, uh, and others, a um, uh, particular person named Bowers, all went uh, across Ross Island in the dead of winter because that's the time when the emperor penguin nests. 
So it was completely dark uh, for months to go get these eggs. And for him, that, that was what lent the, the title to this book. That was the worst part of the whole thing. Then when they got back, it was now Antarctica summer and um, of uh, 1910. And uh, Scott was ready to set out for the South Pole and took Wilson and Bowers, but not Chariot turns out with him to the South Pole. And they, um, as everybody knows, they didn't return. And so Cherry and others who remained at uh, Cape Evans, which was where they had made their original camp, Scott's party did, uh, went out to look for them and they found them frozen in their tents. Ironically, by the time Cherry and uh, the um, survivors got back to England three years later, the theory about embryonic eggs had been discredited. And so the penguin eggs they brought back did not prove useful for science. Endurance, the ultimate tale of deprivation is about Shackleton's expedition of 1914 to 1917. And th this is just a, a horrendous, horrendous time, a very gripping book. And amazingly, no one on his expedition died. Both of these books recount adventures of desperation and resilience. Very interesting. The Worst Journey in the World is considered one of the 10 best travel books of all time. And on some uh, writers lists, it is uh, the best. The existence of Antarctica was only a hypothesis until it was first cited by Thaddeus Bellinghausen in 1820. No one set foot on the continent until 1895. So that's pretty late in the exploration of the planet. 1900 to 1916 is considered the heroic age of exploration, of Antarctic exploration. The South Pole, as we all know, was first reached in 1911 by Amundsen's team from Norway and by Scott's party one month later. And then the first international geophysical year was in 1957-58, and that's what really started the intense interest around the world in Antarctica. And 12 nations at that time built more than 60 research stations on the continent, and they vowed to cooperate for peaceful scientific purposes. All of the photos here were made during Amundsen's expedition. So there's a um, real Los Alamos Mountaineers connection to Antarctica from early on, from 1966. Uh, some of you, especially the old timers watching, will recognize the person in this photo, Ichi Fukushima. He is a, a longtime staff member at Los Alamos National Laboratory and a longtime member of the Los Alamos Mountaineers. And interestingly, he was in the party that made the first ascent of the highest peak in Antarctica, one of the so-called seventh summits, which is Mount Vincent at 16,860 feet. So he was, uh, he was the young member of the American Antarctic Mountaineering Expedition of 1966-67. And um, the team was completely composed of scientists and one physician. Uh, Ichi was at the time a graduate student at the University of Washington, and then he later came to Los Alamos. Uh, his, he was a PhD student in physics, and he was the radio operator for the trip. And what was very interesting to me is a, another connection I have is that the National Science Foundation actually funded that trip. And the National Science Foundation doesn't really fund mountaineering first ascents. But in this case, uh, they were, as I said, a, a group of scientists, and they made a strong case for doing the first geological survey of the area, the Vincent Massif. And, um, and, and so the NSF uh, was persuaded to uh, uh, pay for their logistics uh, through the Navy support contract. And uh, so, um, in, so Ichi is presently living in Albuquerque, retired from the lab. In the year 2006, a 15,200 foot peak in the Sentinel Range, which is the overall range that the Vincent Massif is in, was named Mount Fukushima in honor of his first ascent and his scientific contributions. So 
how big is Antarctica? Well, this uh, figure shows that it is about the size of the United States and Mexico together. On the overlay of the United States, the South Pole is approximately here uh, in Kansas, near the Colorado Nebraska border. And um, Ichi and company's climb in the Vincent Massif was up here in Idaho. I, I think a, a lot of you have heard of Lake Bostock, which is over here in the Midwest. And I'm going to be talking about the National Science Foundation's station, which is the biggest station on the whole continent called McMurdo Station, which is uh, down here in South Texas. And then the, the South Pole, as I mentioned, is an, uh, the, another um, uh, National Science Foundation station. And in fact, the US is the, has the only station of all the countries at the South Pole. And then um, uh, up here is the third station of the National Science Foundation, which runs the US Antarctica program. And it's called Palmer Station. And it's right across from um, Argentina. Uh, I think a, a couple of you, I know Bill and his wife have gone across the Drake Passage from Argentina to what's called the peninsula here. By convention, north is up and east is to the right. More than 170 million years ago, Antarctica was part of the supercontinent Gondwana. And its present shape took, uh, uh, its, its present shape uh, uh, took place about 35 to 25 million years ago. So here you see there's a lot of uh, research stations in Antarctica. As I said, the US has just three of them on the Western part of the continent. There's about 29 countries that have stations in Antarctica and there's um, dozens of field camps. So the geology of Antarctica is unique. It's the major features, the ice that covers the landmass. The ice is on average 1.2 miles thick, but it's much thicker in some place. In fact, over Lake Vostok, which is right here, it's two and a half miles thick. And um, as you can see, it's a continent with a lot of uh, subglacial lakes and rivers. And another feature of the geology is the volcanism, which I'll show you as we travel. So where's McMurdo, the biggest station run by the United States in um, Antarctica? Well, as this little inset shows, it's, it's down south here, it was on the, the South Texas on the US overlay. And um, so here's a close up of McMurdo. And that's where uh, everybody that goes with um, the National Science Foundation that, as I said, runs the US Antarctica program, goes from New Zealand, which is just south of here. It's approximately the same longitude as, um, as Ross Island, which is shown here. And McMurdo Station is on this little peninsula that juts out of the island. So Ross Island is um, composed uh, entirely of volcanoes. And we'll be doing a close-up later of Mount Erebus, which is the southernmost active volcano in the world. And there's a number of other volcanoes here. And it was also the site of all these um, uh, expedition camps of Shackleton and, um, and Scott uh, when they set out to do their, their heroic expeditions. Uh, the access to Ross Island is either by uh, ship and a big uh, icebreaker. The US Polar Star breaks the ice about once a year for the smaller research vessels that's run by the Coast Guard uh, or airplanes that have skis on them. And uh, I'll show you uh, pictures of those uh, later on. The summer population at McMurdo Station is anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 people and the winter population is only a couple of hundred. It turns out that most of the people in, at McMurdo are really staff support for the 200 to 300 scientists who do research there, principally in the summer. Um, so Ross Island is attached to the mainland of Antarctica by the Ross Ice Shelf. And another thing to note, because we'll fly there in a little while, 
is Marble Point over here in what's called the Dry Valleys. It's just east of Ross Island, and we fly there by helicopters. There are many research camps over here in the Dry Valleys, and we'll see some of those. So the distinguishing feature about Antarctica is that it's cold, windy, and dry. At the South Pole, the sun rises for six months in the fall and sets for six months in the spring. The situation is less dire at McMurdo where residents see continuous sun for four months and continuous darkness for the same. The annual precipitation, as you can see, very, very low. I, I think for comparison, Santa Fe's average precipitation is 12 inches, but I understand there's about half that this year. So Santa Fe is also very dry. And you see the only month that, they, that McMurdo Station and the South Pole Station both share as being the same as the hottest month, which is January. But, but there's a lot of variation. They're about 900 miles, a little more than 900 miles apart. So there's um, uh, the territorial claims and all the agreements that relate to Antarctica are all embraced uh, in the Antarctic Treaty System, which regulates international relations with respect to Antarctica. Antarctica is defined as all of the land and ice shelves south of 60 degrees latitude. So the Antarctic Treaty entered into force in 1961 and there's presently about 54 countries that are parties to the treaty, 29 of whom can vote. And the treaty, it's, it's very important for how the world regards Antarctica. It states that the continent should be used only for peaceful scientific purposes and prohibits military activity, mining, nuclear explosions. It encourages international scientific cooperation and research in conserving the resources in the surrounding oceans and protecting the environment. It's nominally enforced until 2048. I think every year uh, the nations gather and, and recertify their um, approval of this treaty. Uh, you notice the United States is not on this map. While the US has a basis for a claim, it does not claim any part of the continent. All right, my four trips to Antarctica spanned a quarter of a century. I was fortunate to go in January of 1996. It was actually during, some of you may remember a, a furlough, it was during the Clinton administration. And um, so it was, it was during that time, there was a, a, a huge, uh, gap in uh, the conduct of the, the federal government there. Everybody was on standby. And so uh, the NSF ran a VIP trip, but only two of us from different agencies decided we could go. And one was the head of NIH, who was Harold Barmas, a Nobel Prize winner. He uh, went and, uh, and I did. The, the head of NASA said, France, you go. I got to stay here. And um, so uh, at that time, we didn't have cell phones, so uh, I, all of my pictures from that trip, I took with a little camera and I put them in a scrapbook, the last scrapbook I ever made because now I have uh, electronic albums, photo albums. So this is my scrapbook and it shows the old South Pole Station, which I'll give you a close-up later. So then my second trip was until November of 2012. And I went with a couple of members of the National Science Board, which, which I was a member at the time. And, um, uh, and then the third trip was in December of 2014 when I was uh, the director of the National Science Foundation and hosted a congressional uh, delegation. There were 10 congressmen who came uh, and they were both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, I was looking to see which ones are still in Congress since 2014, and it turns out half of them are. Uh, four of them are retired from Congress and one is in jail. And then uh, my last trip was just before uh, COVID broke loose and I hosted a, a VIP trip to Antarctica so the science leadership uh, in the administration could uh, get a close up of what their assets are from their agencies in Antarctica. And uh, uh, coming along on the trip was Paul DeBar, the DOE undersecretary, 
the head of USGS, the head of NOAA, the head of NIST, the White House Chief Technology Officer, and the NSF uh, Chief of Staff. So those are my four trips from which I'm going to draw my highlights. So my first highlight is just the vastness of this continent. It's absolutely just gorgeous, breathtaking, as close to being on another planet as we'll ever experience. NASA does a number of exercises in Antarctica to prepare astronauts and robotic rovers for exploring other bodies like the moon and Mars. You really feel alone, but comfortably alone in this vast sea of ice. So I wanna give you a quote from David Campbell's book, which is called The Crystal Desert. It's a beautiful book about Antarctica. He said, Antarctica seemed to be a prebiotic place as the world must have looked before the broth of life bubbled and popped into whales and tropical forests and humans. I was as lonely as an astronaut walking on the moon. So my second highlight is the flights to Antarctica and the flight to the pole. I thought it was one of the best part of the whole trip with the very long flights in the four engine turboprop LC-130 planes that are flown for NSF by the US Air Force. The trip from Christchurch, New Zealand to McMurdo takes eight hours and the trip from McMurdo to the South Pole takes five hours. And it's not an airplane that you can just really get up and walk around in. You're, um, you're strapped to the sides like so much baggage and, and the toilet is inside of curtains, just this makeshift uh, things. Um, there's not much to do. Uh, you have to wear big headphones because the planes are so very noisy. So you see there's a couple of congressmen doing what everybody does. You either read on your um, iPad or you go to sleep. Uh, some of you know Congressman Issa from California, that's him taking a nap. Uh, or you look out the window, which is what I spend a lot of time doing. Uh, here we are with uh, the US um, Air Force uh, who comes along on the trip and his staff for us. And here's the LC-130 plane. It's a plane, uh, the C means uh, that it has skis on it. And here the congressman standing in front of the plane. And you land on a big uh, ice field, which is carefully groomed uh, by large vehicles and checked for surface hardness regularly, especially at McMurdo, so that the plane can land on the ski skis. Um, so it's just the, the views as you get closer to Antarctica when you cross the, the dry valleys, the rugged part is just, just amazing. So my third highlight is McMurdo Station itself, which is shown in the, the top figure here. It's a small um, hodgepodge of a town, like an old mining town. It doesn't seem so small when you're there. A lot of, lot of old dirt roads that are mostly icy. A couple of years ago, Congress approved a half billion dollar upgrade to consolidate operations and improve logistics and make scientific research supported more efficiently on the continent. So um, the, the, it's, the whole town is full of these amazing vehicles, also amazing people. Uh, these vehicles like this, this is called Ivan the Terabus. Um, which can maneuver in this very harsh environment. And they have vehicles that, um, well, this vehicle carries passengers from the ice field, which is called Pegasus, 14 miles to McMurdo. So after you land, you have to get in this vehicle and then get to McMurdo. Um, and there are many other vehicles, all sorts of weird, strange vehicles, including a whole train of them that go about three times during the summer all the way to the South Pole across the Trans-Antarctic Mountains um, and carry supplies. And, and um, yeah, so support of the uh, upkeep of the vehicles, the trucks, the helicopters, and the giant caravan of vehicles uh, that goes along the McMurdo South Pole Highway requires a lot of staff. And one of them is shown here. Many of them are women. And here's the, the hands of the woman in this picture. I thought this was interesting. Her hands are full of oil and grit, but she's wearing green nail polish. Uh, the woman told me they paint each other's nail polish, uh, nails with uh, the, the polish that they um, import. And 
I found that uh, impressive. So more about McMurdo. There's a lot to do for fun around McMurdo. And sometimes you have long waits before you can get um, to the South Pole because of weather. So um, I like those long waits because uh, they're just the area around McMurdo is fascinating. You can hike up Observation Hill, which is shown here, uh, which you can do even at midnight since it's daylight for 24 hours, uh, November to, through February. You can ski, which is what I'm doing with uh, Hal Varmus here uh, on the Ross ice sheet. You can uh, ice fish, which we are doing here and pull up some strange creatures that don't look anything like the trout you fish here. On the summit of Observation Hill is a very touching memorial that Cherry, that the person who wrote that book, The Worst Journey in the World and His Companions, carried up a very heavy, big cross and planted to memorialize Scott's trip to the South Pole. I've hiked up this peak called Ob Hill in um, every trip I've been in, in good weather and really terrible weather when I thought I'd die because it's steep and sometimes just really icy. There's also more than one bar in um, McMurdo and a nicely equipped gym and of course a giant cafeteria where the favorite food turns out is ice cream. There are even marathons and ultra marathons for the truly hardy. The inset of uh, Castle Rock, which is photographed by a person named John, Josh Swanson is something that Alvarez and I hiked up on uh, during the, the first, my first trip. So my number four highlight is Mount Erebus on Ross Island, which I mentioned is the southernmost continuously active volcano in the world. It's 12,500 feet high, so the same height as Kachina Peak at Taos. It was named by Ross, uh, Captain Ross, in 1841 after one of his ships, and he named the mountain close to it, which is not an active volcano, Terror after one of his other ships, so it's Mount Terror. Um, if you want to know who made the first uh, hike up there, uh, it was actually during Shackleton's expedition. Not Shackleton himself, but other members of his party. On my first trip, we flew right over the summit and you could see the lava lake inside the caldera. Uh, nowadays, the pilots aren't authorized to do that. And these are all photographs in that scrapbook I showed you. NSF and NASA funded research like volcanology and astrobiology is conducted on the slopes and in and near the crater. And always uh, you have mountaineering guides when you go anywhere near the crater uh, because there's crevasses, caves, fumaroles uh, all over the place. And um, in fact, when, when Harold and I were skiing and, and hiking out there on the Ross Ice Show, we had a mountaineering guide. It was interesting to me that the guides are just young people who do the same thing in the States, like in uh, Idaho, Montana, Colorado, uh, during our winters, they just love the winter and mountaineering. And so then they, they get paid to go to Antarctica and be guides on Mount Erebus. Uh, Mount Erebus is cl classified as a stratovolcano. The bottom half is a shield and the top half is a stratocone. I found that interesting. Number five highlight is the um, exploration of the dry valleys. I think the most dramatic parts of my trip have been the helicopter explorations of the dry valleys. And we land in all sorts of weird and crazy places. The helicopter pilots are just terrific. We travel in twos, always two helicopters for safeties. And um, the, the dry valleys are not only just very, very beautiful with all the, the different spectacular features. Um, but they're also the location of many of the summer field camps. Um, we made a lot of landings to explore the unusual terrain and, and principally to meet the researchers who work so remotely and talk to them about the science that they're doing. What's amazing is the variety of features. It's all carved by ice and wind but it's definitely influenced by ancient tectonics, earthquakes, volcanoes, rifts. The dry valleys have very, very low humidity. That's why they're called dry. They lack much snow or ice. 
the mountains, in fact, are high enough to block seaward flowing ice from the East Antarctic ice sheet uh, from reaching the Ross Sea. You can uh, see spectacular large scale intrusions like the one up here, sandstone caps, some of the metamorphic and granitic basement rocks and you see glacial tills, moraines, it's, it's just amazing. One of uh, my favorite features is shown right here in the bottom, uh, bottom right, it's called Blood Falls because of the red color. And it really is a red ice fall coming out of this glacier called the Taylor Glacier. It results from subglacial microbes. Under the glacier is an isolated marine system with no light and no oxygen. It has high salinity, high chloride, high sulfate, rich and reduced iron, and bacteria can persist there without photosynthesis and cycle iron and sulfur and carbon. And these, so this intrudes, it falls into Lake Bonnie, which is covered with ice. So I taught astrobiology at one time in the distant past, and I'm pleased to see a number of astrobiologists exploring Antarctica. Another favorite place, um, it's a landing place for us on the helicopter tours called Bull Pass, and that's shown here and here, where um, you see a lot of exposures of dolerite, which is a volcanic basalt. And um, it's resulted from a 180 million year old magma vet that caused the breakup of the Gondwana supercontinent. We'll see another example later. The most obvious feature is called Tafoni, and I think some of you have seen it in the desert uh, southwest. It's honeycombed weathered rocks, and they give the area an otherworldly appearance. So here's more dry valley views from helicopters. If you look closely, you can see field camps in a few of these photos. They're at the foot of tall glaciers, like this one here and here. And right, this little tiny dot here in the middle of a frozen lake is, uh, is a field camp that we flew over. Scientists and their students stay here for the summer doing biology, geology, glaciology, environmental research, and helicopters bring them supplies. The people sleep in tents like this little uh, yellow one or the green one, but the research uh, gets the, the nice uh, facilities with more structural integrity. So now I want to show you one of the, the truly great features that we get to fly over. And first you'll hear some helicopter noise, but then I will silence that. Uh, so this is a, a video. Right, this feature is called gargoyle by some. It was sculpted over 25 million years ago by thermal recycling and wind erosion acting on igneous rocks. And the crystals of feldspar and peroxine expand and contract differently, and that gives it this really weird appearance. The rock is also basalt like dolerite with magma intruding as cells and dikes when this was the upper part of the continental crust 180 million years ago. The magma event that happened then was really extensive, reaching from Australia across the Antarctic to India and Africa when they were all part of the Gondwana supercontinent. So I just, every trip I've been there, I've, uh, the, you see the rotor blades from the helicopter flashing around, but I've uh, tried to get close to the window and, and take a, uh, take a video of this uh, just amazing feature. Nothing, nothing like that I've ever seen. All right. So of course the major objective in my number six highlight of uh, most people when they get to McMurdo is to go on to the South Pole Station called the Amazon Scott South Pole Station. Only the US, as I mentioned, has a permanent presence there and you see it's Pretty permanent looking. Up on the, the top left is the old South Pole Station. So this is taken, that's me standing there in, um, in 1996. And it was just getting completely buried with ice. So at that time, I was part of a team that made a report, part of a White House team that made a report to the Senate 
to argue for making a new South Pole station because it's such an important asset for the United States. So that um, eventually was approved by Congress. And so here's the new South Pole station that uh, finally got um, completely up and running in 2010. So uh, about 10 years ago, and it's on stilts. And, but still the, the uh, snow keeps blowing over it. And so that, that's always uh, a, a peril there is getting, getting buried by the snow and ice, but it, it, it is, does, uh, uh, is able to be, go up higher and higher. So the South Pole is over 900 miles from McMurdo. And um, it's also over 9,000 feet high. So some people who land there feel light of it and require oxygen when they land. So they have a little clinic, medical clinic there. The pilots have to feel confident that the weather is perfect before venturing from McMurdo to the pole. And when they land, they keep their engines running so the fuel doesn't freeze. So thus our visits to the pole have only been a few hours long each time long enough to tour the station, uh, visit the science facilities there, there's uh, a lot of them, and hear from the researchers who are spending the summer there and take the all important photos at the ceremonial pole, which is shown here, and the geographic uh, South Pole. The ceremonial pole it has a lot of flags of nations all around it. The geographic pole moves, of course, uh, all the time. So they're constantly taking up this flag and moving it around. So only the intrepid stay at the pole and experience the 24 hour darkness of Antarctic winter. A few dozen people maintain the facility in the winter and they tend to some of the science experiments. There are um, no other life other than human life at the pole. There's no penguins at the pole. Um, I'm um, happy that I got to see both old and new poles. Um, on my first visit in 1996, as I mentioned, I was traveling with the head of NIH, and so he was interested in biomedicine, all, all things medicine. And so he was very anxious to meet the doctor at the pole to ask her what kind of medical attention occupied her. Her name is Jerry Nielsen, and she replied that it was mental conditions like depression. Well, a year after we left, she discovered a lump on her breast. And so it was during the winter, she did her own biopsy, which proved positive for breast cancer. And then she did her own chemo and was eventually after it turned summer uh, flown to the United States, went into remission, but some years later died from this. There's uh, some famous adventurers that cross the uh, Antarctic on skis and in all sorts of ways, and they always stop to say hello at the pole. The NSF is not supposed to give them aid, it's, that would defeat the spirit of adventure. I met one when I was there. He was determined to cross the entire width of the Antarctic on skis. Uh, I don't know what happened to him, but very few people have done that. While I was at the National Science Foundation a couple of years ago in mid-June um, of 2016, two people became deathly ill at the pole during midwinter, and NSF managed a rescue, a first-time rescue that deep into winter, uh, and um, uh, sent a twin otter plane after these uh, people, um, and uh, they it, the plane was specially modified for that trip. It was successful. It was really kind of a touch and go venture. Uh, and we kept the White House alerted at every step of that journey, made uh, a lot of news. The outcome for the two patients was positive. And I was pleased to sometime later meet uh, one of the pilots who uh, did that uh, adventure. And here's a tweet that just appeared uh, a couple of weeks ago in the NSF news taken during COVID in Antarctic's winter. And um, I thought this was a really um, uh, beautiful picture showing the um, equivalent of the Aurora Borealis, I think it's called the Aurora Australis and uh, the Milky Way and all. So. so my number seven highlight is the science in Antarctica. It's the reason the National Science Foundation stewards Antarctica for the US, it's not really to fly adventurers uh, around. And uh, you see there's a lot of different kinds of science. Uh, the 
the science that I know the best because I'm an astrophysicist is the cosmology that's done there that is really outstanding. But you see, there's a lot of different kinds of science, um, uh, a lot of uh, variations of geology and magnetospheric physics. So that's, uh, that's the reason that uh, the NSF stewards in Antarctica. So I'll just show you a couple of um, uh, pictures of facilities at the South Pole. Since I'm an astrophysicist, I pick astrophysical ones. Uh, the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory at the top left is um, really, th this is where the, the people who operate it are, but the, the whole observatory itself is underground. In fact, it takes up a lot of space, a cubic kilometer of ice which has um, strings of thousands of photomultipliers going down a kilometer. And these detect the blue Cherenkov light emitted when a neutrino is captured by an ice molecule. It recently, a couple of years ago, detected neutrinos from an active galaxy. This is an artist's conception of an active galaxy here, far, far away. Um, what was outstanding about that is did the detection in collaboration with a satellite called the Fermi satellite, which helped position uh, the, uh, the source and identify it because it saw uh, intense gamma rays coming at the same time the neutrinos were detected. Um, but the real significance of this is that it uh, settled the age-old question of the origin of high energy cosmic rays, which had been a mystery for uh, over a hundred years. The South Pole Telescope, shown here, makes observations of the cosmic microwave background and does galaxy studies. There's a, a photo of me on the most recent trip in December of 2019, holding up an image of a black hole in the nucleus of the galaxy M87. I think you might remember that this uh, image made uh, news, you know, in fact, headlines, front pages all over the world in April of 2019, uh, when it was first announced. And it was voted the breakthrough of the year by Science Magazine. It turns out the South Pole Telescope was one of several telescopes distributed worldwide, which contributed to this iconic image. My eighth highlight is the huts of the early explorers. Remember I showed you this picture of Ross Island. So these huts, are all located around the eastern side here, here, and here. And the first hut that was established was by Scott, Admiral Scott, on his discovery expedition. And um, it's next to the present day McMurdo Station. And um, so it's not, not much left there. This photo was actually my NSF Christmas card in 2014. I was very uh, proud of that. But, getting to go there, go back there. Scott's uh, real working hut, which um, he um, uh, constructed on the Terra Nova expedition that I told you a little bit about at the beginning, was at Cape Evans. And that's shown right here. And it's very well maintained. Of course, it's preserved in the, the dry cold air of Antarctica, but it also has a lot of volunteers which maintain this hut. And then there's Shackleton's hut, which you see here uh, with Mount Erebus in the background, um, which he uh, and our comrades constructed during the Nimrod expedition at Cape Royds. So this is at Cape Royds, this is at Cape Evans, and this one's at McMurdo. And um, th this is only one shot I have of hundreds of the insides of, uh, of the, the huts. They, everything is preserved there. It's just amazing. There's um, uh, photos, bedding, food, dog houses. You see the, the dog houses outside of Shackleton's hut here. Mummified animal carcasses. Um, even whiskey has been discovered on the floorboards there. Uh, so it's, uh, it's just amazing how much you can see of how those um, early explorers over a hundred years ago lived what they, they ate and did. And of course, my ninth highlight is penguins. That's um, the most photographed, uh, photographed thing uh, in Antarctica are the, uh, the penguins. Uh, people are just so enchanted with these creatures. They're so different from every other animal and they're relatively friendly. 
the Adelie penguin rookery at Cape Royds, which is in the top of photo here, so it's right next to the Shackleton uh, hut, is one of the largest in Antarctica. And down here are just uh, thousands of, uh, and, and all around on the rocks, thousands of Adelie, the, the smaller penguins. Um, it literally stinks with the excrement of those thousands. The skua birds are constantly trying to steal the eggs and they also eat chicks. We would sit for a long time on the rocks above the rookeries, watching the penguins interact with each other and travel out to sea. The other photos are of emperor penguins and they're uh, a little harder to find in a kind of rookery like this. So what we do in the helicopters is scout around and see when we saw some and the pilots would decide if they could land there, if the uh, ground were uh, firm enough to land. And, uh, and we did that a number of times. And then people would take out their, um, their cameras and selfie sticks and all that and uh, do um, pictures of them. Uh, as uh, you heard, they do their nesting in winter, which is why Cherry and his colleagues intent on getting those emperor penguin eggs did their hazardous winter trek from Cape Evans to Cape Crozier. So I would like you to hear what these emperor penguins sound like. So I'm going to play this. charming creatures. So number 10, I was surprised and honored at my farewell event in DC last February when uh, I was presented at NSF with this plaque. And so this whole thing is one plaque, which says that the feature in the photo here um, was named for me. It happens to be in the Pleiades range of peaks. The petitioners of this award, which are the two people who are guests tonight, Brian Stone and Scott Board, knew that the Pleiades is a special constellation for me because it's also known as the Seven Sisters, and I'm from a family of seven sisters. The naming is done by the US Board on Geographic Names Advisory Committee on Antarctic Names. On my last trip home from Antarctica in December of 2019, the pilots flew over this feature so I could see it from the cockpit. So how to get to Antarctica? Well, you can uh, determine that you're gonna climb all seven summits and include Mount Vincent here. Uh, and um, this is um, long and expensive, but it is definitely doable. There are planes that fly out of the peninsula to the Mount Vincent uh, area. Or you can join ANSMET, a uh, picture of ANSMET researchers is shown here. ANSMET stands for the Antarctic Search for Meteorites Program. They have found about 20,000 meteorites. They're easy to find on the ice when they land on the ice because of the contrast. Most of those come from asteroids, but some from the moon and Mars. You can apply for a research grant from the NSF or NASA and that requires some uh, credentials, but a um, lot, lot of people uh, do that and do uh, just outstanding research. You can be a technician or other support person doing cooking or cleaning, uh, driving, all sorts of things, and apply to the NSF contractor, which is called LIDAS. Or you can pay a company uh, a lot of money to cruise from South America to the peninsula. There are mountaineering tours, uh, there are uh, cruises, all kinds of uh, tourism. Uh, the United States doesn't um, really uh, do that. I, I think most of the tours are done by other countries in South America. Russia does some tours. Um, I do want to note that it's not easy to get to the South Pole. Uh, it's um, the only country that I've known that has flown a tour in there, and that's very rarely, is, is Russia. 
Um, and uh, so it's, uh, you, you have to try really hard to get to the South Pole. And we've seen some of those intrepid researchers uh, crossing the versus of on skis. So I want to conclude my talk with uh, Cherry's own words, which are at the end of his memoir of the ill-fated Scott expedition. It's a sober meditation on the nature of exploration. And um, let me uh, just read you um, a passage, uh, just a couple of words of this, not, not the whole thing. But he says, there are many reasons which send men to the poles, but the desire for knowledge for its own sake is the one which really counts. And there's no field for the collection of knowledge which at the present time can be compared to the Antarctic. If you have the desire for knowledge and the power to give it physical expression, go out and explore. If you march your winter journeys, you will have your reward so long as all you want is a penguin's egg. Cherry says that for, for him, the Scott expedition was as much a scientific expedition as an exploration a march to the South Pole. And in this, it differed from Amundsen's South Pole expedition, which was purely driven by that desire to get to the pole. And Cherry says in his memoir that this singular focus may have resulted in Amundsen's success, whereas the Scott expedition had a number of scientific aims which diffused the goal of achieving the South Pole first. The irony that even Cherry couldn't have realized when he wrote this memoir is that though the science he was aiming for was debunked and the journey to the pole was a disaster, he himself, Cherry, left a lasting written legacy that describes with great honesty the fragile nature of adventure, its rewards, its sacrifice. And he's left us with the legacy of hope, hope that we can maintain this continent for science and for inspiration. So thank you for your attention and I welcome your comments. Wonderful, thank you so much, Prince. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, we have had a few questions come in and folks, if you're watching and have any questions for Prince, uh, go ahead and type them in the chat now and I will relay them to her after we get through these uh, first few. So let's see. Um, the first question uh, we got is, was the old US South Pole station disassembled and how long did that take? Yeah, it was definitely disassembled and I understand some parts are in museums, uh, a, a, a big piece of it in, is in Colorado and uh, perhaps in other places. Um, I, I don't, there, there are people on this call who do know how long it took because they were there, um, but I, I don't know in, in detail. I just know that um, it took, it, it was being disassembled at the same time that the other one was being built. And so that whole process, I, I said, we turned in our report in something like 1996 and the station was sort of up in 2008, but not really fully functioning to 2010. So it took that whole, you know, a decade, more than a decade to get all approved for appropriations and then taking one down. You know, every piece had to be flown out at that time. Now I mentioned there are trains of cars that, that do the traverse and that, that's been just a godsend, so much less expensive. And um, they, um, uh, can can carry the fuel uh, and all the supplies back and forth, uh, just just so much fa really faster and cheaper because the, the flights are so very expensive and few and far between. Uh, so, um, but at that time, it, it took a very long time. And you know, some of these questions, if if people want to follow up with me and they send uh, could send comments uh, to me via email, I can give you my email address. It's just francancordova at gmail.com that, um, that, you know, if they really want to know the answers and I don't know them, I can get them. Sure. Awesome. Um, and I think you said Brian is one of your guests. Is that right? Yes. He said some of the pole panels are at the CB Museum and I think Ohio State has a chunk too. Okay, so, great, great. Interesting. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, he should know. 
<laughs> so let's see. Um, someone asked, can you describe one or two of the major science experiments currently going on in Antarctica? Well, I uh, described a, a couple, which were the, um, so the, the ice cube uh, neutrino observatory is going on and they're all, they're doing uh, an upgrade. Uh, of course, now with COVID and all, you know, it's very, very hard to get uh, people there. Uh, to my knowledge, we haven't had any incident of COVID, but have been extremely careful. But another station, the Chilean station has, uh, about a month ago, and so um, so, but there there is um, a proposal to uh, upgrade the Ice Cube Observatory, the um, the the telescope that studies the microwave background and all the galaxies and all is uh, always being uh, refurbished. There are uh, and so they they have made major contributions to our understanding of the origin of high energy cosmic rays and um, you know, imaging the black hole and all. Um, one of my favorite places, and I, I didn't show it here um, because of time, but is um, the balloon facility that NASA runs. It's several miles from McMurdo, and we travel out there in these special cars, these truck-like cars uh, in a little caravan. And every time I've gone, I've insisted on going there because they, they have it about three, um, at any time, about three balloon experiments going on in different um, uh, buildings. Uh, and um, there's a lot of graduate students with their uh, faculty mentors there. And they're doing uh, amazing experience, uh, experiments on the magnetosphere and on um, cosmic rays and you know, high, high energy uh, particles in general. And, um, and I've been fortunate to see a couple of the balloons um, as they were, uh, they were launched. They, they are really long duration balloons because of the location and all. So those are some of the experiments. When we go to the dry valleys, as I said, we get to land and talk with the researchers there. And mostly they're doing, um, you know, the kind of field work that you expect, a little bit of astrobiology, but more geology and environmental studies. And then and on our last trip, we were fortunate to uh, be there at the same time at the science headquarters at McMurdo, the people who are studying the Thwaites Glacier that folks have heard so much about that is really changing a lot. Um, it, it, our, were there and they uh, explained their whole um, study and what they're learning about the Thwaites Glacier and how fast it's uh, melting and so on. So it, there, there's just a whole range of science going on. I bet, yeah, that's uh, great. Thank you so much for um, sharing those, those few examples. Um, so let's see, uh, Rod asked, uh, has anyone been born in Antarctica? Oh. Brian? <laughs> and actually the Brian that uh, messaged me before, he wasn't the Brian you know, but he uh, worked on the ice as a worker from 99 to 07. So mm -hmm. um, Brian Stone said at the Chilean stations, yes. Oh, the Chilean stations, born. good. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, so someone so asked, oh, go people, ahead, sorry. People, as I said, people have died there, uh, which is the thing we're, we're more familiar with. Fortunately, during the, the time that I've been most involved, uh, most people have survived illnesses, but not accidents. And so yeah, I had a little cautionary note on my overview. Uh, so what we had uh, in the time that I served my, my six years, we, we had about three deaths in, in Antarctica, yeah, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, someone asked, um, what happens when the Antarctic treaty, treaty expires? Well, we were hoping that it will be continued. Uh, and that's the idea why people get together uh, periodically uh, to uh, see how everything is going and to you know, check each other's pulse and, and uh, try to ensure that the continent is preserved that way. Uh, it's like any other treaty. I mean, you, you renew it or, you know, that, I think that, that would be a bad consequence if it stopped. Um, so it's the, the goal of the US to continue to use it for peaceful uh, and scientific purposes. And, and so far it is the goal of uh, 53 other uh, entities as well. 
Um, so let's see. Um, someone asked, what is the like infrastructure like in Antarctica, like running water, electricity, those sorts of things? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, that that's, uh, yeah, it's pretty primitive. And Bri Brian Stone is on the call, is in charge of all of it. So he knows the details. They have this waste treatment plant that just, when I first visited it, I resolved I would never, that was the one thing in Antarctica that on my future trips, I would never go back and see it just grossed me out. You know, they, they recycle everything. And, uh, but they have a lot of uh, the diesel fuel, you know, you have to have fuel that can withstand the cold temperatures and all. Um, they they have uh, a number of the places where where you would stay and live. At, you know, and I, as I said, I've been there over a quarter of a century. So my first place, I think it's been torn down. There were primitive, more primitive facilities, and they're just kept. Uh, but now the facilities are nice, but it's sort of like living um, in kind of army barracks, right? I mean, it has that that kind of feeling. With the new uh, refurbishment of McMurdo that the Congress approved a couple of years ago, and it's also being delayed because of COVID, of course, and getting contractors, uh, people down there to do it. Um, they, it. It will be much, much upgraded and things will be more consolidated and, and uh, you know, just with better better structures and, and much uh, tighter, faster logistics so that more um, money and attention can be paid to the science. Um, but it's a, it's a very primitive mining town kind of quality. And it also reminds me, when I was at UC Santa Barbara, I was there before UC Riverside, we had these Quonset huts that were from the 50s. And even though there were these gorgeous buildings for nanotechnology and all sorts of things being put up all the time, nobody wanted to let go of the old stuff. And so it's just stayed there in the shadow of the new things. And McMurdo definitely has that, that quality that every time something is built, all the old stuff stays. People get attached to it. <laughs> yeah, Brian, the not Brian Stone, but the other Brian said it's sort of a cross between a mining town and a community college, labs, cafeteria, heavy equipment. Yeah. So, um, the and the cafeteria is a great experience. It's worth going down there for that because, as I said, uh, you know, the average age of people who go there and, and the average age of the VIPs is like 60 something, but the average age of the staff. <laughs> It's in you know, 20s and 30s and uh, and they're, they're just great and they're, they're adventurers and they're the ones that do the ultra marathons and uh, and they 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 just talk about all the things they do, which are, are you know, to keep the whole place going and uh, it's uh, and, and they're very well you know, trained and monitored because safety is, is a very, very important thing. And we, we have in the federal agency something called an inspector general and she goes down there with her troops every a couple of years just to make sure that we're all doing everything right, so. On track. <laughs> um, let's see. So I'm, I'm getting to my last couple questions. So folks, if you're watching and you have one that you haven't asked yet, be sure to drop that in the chat um, just so we don't we don't miss you. Um, so let's see. Next question is who controls the access to the historic huts? Oh, yeah, that's that's a great question. These are run by um, private entities. They're, they're volunteers, but um, I don't know, maybe Brian Stone will know the answer to that. What, who is, you know, if it's some national organization or society that has, it's not, it's not the National Science Foundation, although of course we uh, help them out with their logistics and all that, but they are, they are privately funded from charitable groups. Um, Brian said the Antarctic Heritage Trust from New Zealand. Okay, oh, for New Zealand. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't mention again because of time, but only uh, three or four kilometers from McMurdo is what's called the Kiwi Station. It's New Zealand Station, which makes a lot of sense because, as I said, McMurdo's at the longitude of New Zealand. So uh, we do a lot of things with with New Zealand. Well, at Christchurch, of course, we have the big NSF facility where they 
give you your outfit, all your clothes and, and your training and, and the planes fly out of there and, and all. And we're, we work a lot with the New Zealand people and, um, and they, uh, they have a, a whole little village themselves. It's much, much smaller than McMurdo and it's all painted green, the Kiwi green. Uh, so there's a lot of collaboration uh, between the US and New Zealand uh, on behalf of Antarctica. Okay. Yeah, Brian said um, they do all the conservation and come down through the New Zealand program every year to conserve the huts. The huts are protected under, under the Antarctic Treaty. So thank you for, uh, for adding that too. Um, let's see. Uh, we've been getting a lot of people also just saying like great presentation, wonderful job. Someone asked um, if it's being recorded. Um, it is, and we'll, it'll be up on the Peak YouTube channel. It usually takes us a couple of weeks to process recordings and get them up. So um, keep an eye out for that. Um, let's see, the last couple of questions, unless anyone else uh, pops one in the chat. Um, someone asked, how long were you there each time? Oh yeah, not, not long enough, just a, a week each time. Um, they, um, you know, they, they try, I, <laughs> I'm not sure visitors like us are assets. <laughs> I mean, we, we are in the sense that we, you know, ultimately you need congressional appropriations in order to keep the whole thing going, right? And so you need agency heads and that's why I took down the science heads because NIST has facilities and things that they are assets. They are not really facilities, but, and, and NASA and, um, and the Department of Energy and all. And so, so it gets all the heads of these science agencies excited about what's going on. And then when they uh, present their budgets and talk to Congress, and of course we all work together on certain things um, that we wanna see done down there, uh, especially uh, experiments and, and some facilities. So it's really Im important to have the, um, the uh, science leaders go down there, but, um, but, but when you see they pull out all stops and they try to make our visit just perfect and they have pictures of us so that people will, will recognize us and they won't say anything rude in front of us. And they, they have a big party for us the night before we leave, which is just, uh, just wonderful. I mean, the staff are, are incredible there. And um, uh, yeah, so, so we, we can stay about a week. They, uh, and so, some trips that, um, uh, like National Science Board members, which is the policy organization that governs NSF go down, they don't uh, even make it to the South Pole because uh, safety is obviously just like at the lab, it's the number one thing. And you you just, and constantly, constantly changing, checking the weather. And there are microclimates there all the time. So the South Pole weather can be completely different than McMurdo weather, which can obviously be much different than New Zealand weather. And so just monitoring that continuously. And so we've been held back in New Zealand, which is not a bad place, by the way, to be held back, lots to do there. Um, but, um, and but certainly at McMurdo and my first trip there I that's why we got so much skiing and hiking done was because we couldn't get to the South Pole for a few days um, so altogether I would say the trips are from seven to uh, to ten days uh, but most of the researchers spend a lot longer there got it um, and then the last question I have kind of going off of that actually um, so how many or how many staff members live in Antarctica year round? Is there like a year round population? Well, yeah, there's um, uh, at, at my last count, there's something like uh, uh, 12, well, at McMurdo Station, something like 1200 people there in the summertime, the Antarctic summer, but only uh, a few dozen, um, like let's say 40-ish people would stay there for the, the winter. Um, okay, because that is uh, much more difficult. Yeah, they're just keeping up uh, the place. And some scientific experiments have to be uh, tended to and all. But over the whole continent, there's uh, a few thousand people because there are, um, you know, dozens of, um, of stations there and everybody has, I, I believe, has some presence there during 
the winter uh, the winter as well as of course the summer and in the summer i don't even know what the population is because of the tourism that goes on not at mcmurdo of course that's not a tourist destination and we we don't see tourists unless they are um you know, science leaders. But um, on the peninsula that I showed that's across from Argentina, Chile, that, that's where the boats go. And um, there's a, 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 a lot of tourists that go in and out at that time. Nice. Um, one more question just came in uh, from Luke, who is seven. He asked, um, who was the first person to land on Antarctica? Oh, that was the uh, Bellinghausen in uh, Theodore Bellinghausen in 1895. So for for Luke, who's only seven, that was a long time ago, but for me, not so long ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so Antarctica hasn't been uh, hasn't been much explored compared to other places. So yeah, got so it. Thank you, Luke. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that question, Luke. Um, so those are all of the questions that came in. France, thank you so much for sharing your adventures with us. That was fascinating and a, a great way to kind of get a look at Antarctica for those of us that won't probably ever get to venture there. Um, but you should. That was the whole idea of giving the talk. That, that is. <laughs> that's true. I, um, who knows? Who knows what life holds, right? Yeah. And um, I want to thank both Bryants for uh, help. Yes, and I think I think they know each other and say say hello. Um, so hello from one Brian to another in the chat. Um, and let's see, everyone's just saying thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation! Um, some applauses and things like that coming in. Um, well, thank you, so Rachel. Thanks. thanks for yeah, of, of for course, this. of course. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, if you'd like to tune in for additional programs from Peak, uh, be sure to visit our website, peaknature.org, for other offerings. And don't forget about the ski waxing seminar happening tomorrow evening with Clay Mosley and the Mountaineers um, and the Southwest Nordic Ski Club. The next Mountaineers meeting will be coming up on Tuesday, February 23rd, and we'll hear about Dylan Boyle's experiences setting out to establish a new bike packing route in northern New Mexico. Um, so you can register for that event and many more now. Again, that's peaknature.org slash events. Um, some other folks said they enjoyed a trip to Antarctica. They're planning to ski there in November 23. So it sounds like a few folks in the chat um, are, planning, are planning to head there as well. So that's wonderful to hear. Again, thank you so much, France and all of the Mountaineers. And have a great night, everyone. Thank you.